so, um, yeah. So this will be the second part of uh, John Quincy Adams' class, but because there's six people that were not at the first, I'll make a summation of his life, very brief. And then I'll recommend people to uh, go on the YouTube and see the first one. Uh, not because so much because I gave it, <laughs> but uh, it's a part of his life and what he did regarding uh, making the foundation. What I went through last time was uh, a part of the fight the last 18 years in Congress uh, where he really mobilized the North against slavery uh, uh, through all the debates in the US Congress that was noted up and brought into the newspapers on a daily basis. And um, uh, so this is not being reported in books and, and so forth, so I think that it's a very crucial part because without that mobilization of the North, uh, it's very doubtful that Lincoln could have done what he did. So, but I will make a short summation of his life uh, when I come to it. I would like to start from a little bit uh, different. You saw it, so up there, be thou faithful until death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Well, uh, from the very beginning of the formation of this nation, from when people landed in Plymouth in 1620, uh, the key fight, and this is the fight that we had today, and this is a fight that's been going on for the last several thousand years now, uh, is a fight, are we going to have a society <coughs> where the dignity of man, the inalienable rights of man are being respected, or are we going to have continuous empire and oligarchy treating people as animals, as subjects? And uh, throughout uh, European history, there has been the fight. And you had a group of people, as you all know here, that uh, were persecuted by the British and tried to figure out together and raise the money and be allowed to and conspire and so forth to come to the United States on the Mayflower and then later other ships and landed in Plymouth in 1618. I really recommend that people go in on the internet and get a um, EIR from 2006, number 43, uh, where you have an excellent article by Bob Ingram Robert Ingram uh, on the, um, uh, this uh, background for that history, both the, what happened in Europe before uh, the people came on the Mayflower, the signing of the social compact uh, before they landed on the soil of the United States. Uh, it's a very thorough, um, thorough foundation and it leads directly into later on the fight to do good the, the, the discussions about the forming of the principles upon which this nation is founded. Because people, you've often heard uh, LaRouche talk about CUSA and how the ideas of CUSA was essential in uh, uh, when CUSA said we have to find another, uh, go across the waters to find another place away from oligarchy and where we can um, found a nation, a new society, based on uh, ideas of man, that man is the right hand of the creator, and man has creativity, and man is not a subject. And um, I think this article will be very useful for people to read too. Another thing I wanted to take up, and there you can find it also in EIR from 2004, that's Leibniz, because there was a big effort uh, to suppress the ideas of Leibniz. Uh, actually, for 50 years, key writings of Leibniz were kept in uh, Britain uh, under lock and key. Uh, and uh, there was a big conspiracy to get these ideas to leading people, leading fighters in the United States. And key writings of Leibniz found the hands of Benjamin Franklin, got into the hands of Benjamin Franklin after being buried for 50 years. And uh, the background for that whole fight, which leads to, the, which is crucial for the founding ideas of the United States, the founding principles of the United States, you will find in the EIR from 2004, I believe it's number 32, but you can look it up, it's 2004 by Phil Valenti. What's the number for the one about John? Uh, 43. Uh, Ingram? 
Robin Robert Ingram, the yeah. Landing, yeah. People. Yeah. What's the that? reason I think these things are so important is that in order, uh, in order to all the time uh, for us individual uh, fighting to win back the United States, it is so important that we sharpen our intent, that we sharpen our insight regarding the founding principles of this nation and how they came to these shores and how they were fought for, so that those principles uh, bec become alive and constantly uh, reactivated in ourselves in order to shape our mind and our intent. Because then, when you, when, you, when you base yourself upon these principles, you get a lot of energy, you get a lot of ideas, kind of, it's a whole new geometry of the way of thinking and the way you think about yourself as a human being. And therefore, it is so crucial because everything else outside, we are complete taken over nation, uh, culturally, economically, and so forth. This is not the United States, what we have today. The principles are still alive. The principles are still here. Uh, and we are the heritage and should really work our, uh, ourselves individually to master these ideas as much as possible from the past to be the living heritage in this fight to take America back. Uh, so that's why I'm stressing, and that's why I want to take up some key ideas of Leibniz. Um, you all know uh, the Declaration of Independence, where so we hold these truths to be self-evident. That is, they are self-evident that all men are created <coughs> equal and are born with certain inalienable rights. That is, they cannot be taken away from you. You are born with them. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That was a big fight at the time that instead of happiness, it should be property. And actually, many foreigners think it's property. Like I've had these discussions with Chinese several times, and think luck won over, and that this is what was in the declaration of the, Chi of the um, American uh, country. So the happiness, the idea of happiness, comes from Leibniz. And I wanted to, you can find, you can find it on the internet. Uh, it's a paper called Leibniz on Felicity, that is, on happiness. It is 16 points. And it's 16 points that you could discuss for hours. Mm -hmm. So you have to go back, look it up, and study it and think for yourself. But it is Leibniz's idea on felicity that is the idea behind happiness. And since uh, John Quincy Adams, he was, he lived, he was the living embodiment of the principles that founded this nation, of the Declaration of Independence and the preamble to the Constitution. In order really to understand what got him to think, what got him to tick with a, a modern expression, uh, people, each one of us has to ourselves think through these very profound ideas, so it doesn't just, oh, and then he did this, and then he did that, and he was a great man, but what was it that made him great? What was it that uh, shaped his intent uh, was these ideas? So I will take, uh, and that's not paying total, it's not totally uh, right to do, but I have to do it brief, go through some of the points of these 16 points on felicity, okay? So are you ready? Yeah. Oops. Okay. I drop all point one just to whet your appetite. I take point number two, and I have problems with my accent here. Wisdom. <laughs> Wisdom is the science of felicity and is what must be studied above all other things. That is, the basis for happiness is, this, is wisdom. Okay. 3.3, felicity, that is happiness, is a lasting state of pleasure. It's not sense perception, it's a lasting state of pleasure. Thus it is good to abandon or moderate pleasures which can be injurious by causing misfortunes or by blocking the attainment of better and more lasting pleasures. Point four, pleasure is the feeling of perfection, not only in ourselves but also in others. For in this way, some further perfection is aroused in us. Five, to love is to find pleasure in the perfection of another. 
And I'll drop over a whole bunch of points and take the very last point, point number 16. It is most true as a result that one cannot know God without loving one's brother, that one cannot have wisdom without having charity, which is the real touchstone of virtue, and that one even advances one's own good in working for that of others. For it is an internal, eternal law of reason and of the harmony of things that the works of each person will follow it. Thus, the sovereign wisdom has so well regulated all things that our duty must also be our happiness, that all virtue produces its own reward, and that all crime punishes itself sooner or later. That is, that our duty must also be our happiness. Very similar to the idea of Schiller on the beautiful soul, that what you are inclined to do and wish to do is also what is necessary to do. Uh, but uh, look it up on the internet, Leibniz on Felicity. That was, these ideas were given to Benjamin Franklin and was uh, very consciously uh, put into the Declaration of so Inalienable Rights and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of wisdom, that is, felicity. Uh, and then what the profound ideas, what that entails concerning love, charity, and how to order society uh, regarding that. And if you then look at the preamble to the Constitution regarding the general welfare and uh, posterity, the future, you begin to get an idea of uh, the discussion at the time and what really is the fundament for this nation. And that is what is not here anymore. It is here, that, as LaRouche said the other day, the principles are still alive, uh, but it is up to us to make sure we, uh, and we can rekindle the heritage. We are the people that uh, are the living heritage of the founding fathers. So, uh, and I think that a key weapon that we have is to realize that, that the capabilities are there. Uh, this is the first nation that was ever founded upon these principles. And what was very clear from George Washington uh, was that this is for everybody. It was very clear also for John Quincy Adams and other key founding fathers that this was not just for America, this was for everybody. That the inalienable rights of man uh, is for, if you're from Sudan, from Denmark, from wherever, even Sweden. <laughs> I would say Mark Diane is not here, I was going to have fun with her. So, um, and this is what John Quincy Adams lived his entire life. He and George Washington were very close. Um, I mentioned last time how he, when he was uh, in his early 20s, how he wrote these anonymous papers uh, to support George Washington and uh, John Adams, his father, and so on. And when um, George Washington figured out who that was, he was very pleased and immediately uh, wanted John Quincy Adams to be sent to Europe as an ambassador. And he told John Adams, uh, his father, I'm very pleased with your son. I, your son think like me. And I cannot go into detail, but if you look at those, if you want to do a real fun little research, if you look at um, those papers, Marcellus, M-A-R-C-E-L-L-U-S, uh, the writings, uh, these anonymous writings that he did, and then you read uh, George Washington's farewell speech, which was done years later, you will see almost some of the sentences are the same as John Quincy Adams as a young man. Very, very similar ideas. You can always speculate who got what from what, but they were very, very close. And George Washington was to John Quincy Adams, was a, he said, next to my father, he is my big hero, uh, George Washington. So, and that stayed until, uh, until George Washington had passed away. I'm now going to give you, for the sake of the people that were not here last time. I'm going to give a very brief outline of his life, okay? He, um, uh, when he's a little kid, uh, seven, six, seven, eight years old, nine years old, 
His father is gone all the time. He is down in Philadelphia, where, uh, and they are formulating the, uh, the new leadership for the United States. Uh, you have US being overrun by the British. He's living alone with his mom in Braintree. And he describes very vividly when one evening where there's a lot of noise outside and it turns out this is the attack on Bunker Hill. And they, his mother take him up on a little hill that connects if you go to Boston. And so they could see the battle uh, from Bunker Hill from there. He was seven years old. And he described how every day they, were, they could have been attacked. They could have been just the house invaded and taken over and they could all have been killed and so on. And that's kind of how he, the situation was when he was little, the dad was never there. And then when he's 11 years old, uh, his dad takes him to Europe uh, because he's the, uh, John Adams is sent on a mission, on a diplomatic mission to Europe. And uh, that starts an intense training of John Quincy Adams. He will go back and forth um, as a young man. I mean, already when he's 14, he has his first official task as a translator. He's being sent as a translator with the American representative to St. Petersburg. And he's there for a year, year and a half, and then he travels on his own when he's 16 years old. He travels over Sweden through Denmark back to Europe. He takes his little time because he's 16 and he wants to kind of experience a little bit of the world. Uh, he has gone to the University of Leiden before that, where the people gathered that came uh, to Plymouth and the Mayflower, uh, a very famous old university. And um, to Harvard for a couple of years, uh, and then uh, as I forget now in the early 20s, after he's written these Marcellus papers, uh, he is uh, sent as the first ambassador, uh, his first ambassadorship to Holland. And from that point on, until he literally drops dead in Congress, he is in public service of the United States. He will end up becoming ambassador to five different nations in Europe. And of course, he gets fluent in Dutch, in French, in German, in Russian. He reads Greek, he reads Italian, and he translates, he does intelligence work on behalf of uh, the United States. Uh, he goes to operas, he, he does intense studies of home or astronomical studies. He has one project after the other. He is like a real in a good sense, obsessive person concerning knowledge. He just has one project after the other. He tries to push himself. So he writes up what he's now going to do. OK, up at 4, uh, I'm going to read now the Bible, and three chapters in Greek, three chapters in German. Then I have to take a walk of four miles, and I have to walk so and so fast. And then I can have breakfast. And he tries to time himself. He, all the time, he kind of makes new things what he has to do. So he spends, um, he has a little trip back where he is a senator in the United States. And there's a big, I cannot go through it here, but it's a, a major, major um, uh, watershed for him in his life. Uh, when he's a young senator for the Federalists uh, in Massachusetts, he, um, uh, one of the American ships are being shot at Chesapeake. And at that time, the British simply go in and they take over boats and they take American uh, sailors and they just take them, so-called impressment. They take them and put them all on their boats. And at that point, they had already taken 9,000 American, young American men from American ships and put them all on, Amer on the, uh, uh, English ships. So John Quincy Adams is furious and he wants to have an embargo of uh, British ships and so on. And the Federalist wanting to have money uh, they fire him as senator, and uh, he's, there was really, he stood up to the party, he stood up on principles, uh, despite his mother attacked him, and uh, staggered beyond belief, as he wrote to him, while his dad said, I don't agree with your mom. So, but apart from being, and also what he tried to do when he still was a senator, he launched, he put in a program for vast internal improvement of the United States. That was already, as a young man, he had the idea. Uh, it all flows from the principle, of, that's why I wanted to start out, that his entire life was shaped around the inalienable rights of man and the general welfare, but more from a philosophical height what those principles mean. Um, and so 
how how is that going to be carried out? Uh, that is, he would just return or be based upon those principles and that how he judged everything, which uh, actually is a very good way to figuring out today if you want to figure out if something is wrong or right with any policies. If you base them upon uh, those principles, you can always figure out uh, what is what is right, what is black, and what is white. So. Anyway, he's been 20 years in Europe, ambassador to five different nations. He's been a state senator for a little period in between. And he comes back as secretary of state when he's 50 years old. He's secretary of state for two terms, the greatest secretary of state the United States had ever had. And I'm going to go through some of these things that he does. And then he becomes president for one term. And then for the last 18 years of his life, he's an American Congress, a US congressman which he says is the most, the greatest period of his life. And I think it's very important to reflect over because um, he's had this incredible rich life. And here he is as an old man, and Jackson has taken over. The Second National Bank has been destroyed. The slaveholding states with a massive support from Britain is getting more and more power. John Quincy Adams already in 1820 40 years before it happened, a uh, forecast, he was a great forecaster, he saw it the way that LaRouche thinks today. So 40 years before the Civil War, he forecast that we're going to have a Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did it several times in his memoirs. He writes that this is inevitable, that mm -hmm. we're going to have a Civil War. So you have this old man, he's 63 when he goes into Congress, I think he's 63 when he comes into US Congress. And as he says, look, the teeth are dropping out of me one by one. I mean, it's different to be 63 today than at that time. <laughs> and he, uh, he has all these fights. He has a gag rule on him in US Congress for nine years. He's not allowed to present any petitions. And he thinks that this is the greatest uh, uh, position he's had. He's the happiest in his life. So literally, to <coughs> the day he had a stroke in the US Congress, he fights, and um, and he, as he could do what LaRousse has often said, you have to live a life so you can die with a smile on your face. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of life he did. So that's very brief. You can look at the first um, half, uh, or the first part, where I go more in depth, uh, because it's quite fun, his, his upbringing, actually. So, and also, I forgot one very important thing, crucial thing, very much like we are doing today and very much like LaRouche is doing. He's educating his entire life. He's educating people around him. Uh, as George Washington has said, we need an educated citizenry. And um, uh, he starts out with, um, he starts out with Marcellus. I think that's the first, first uh, the anonymous uh, writings. And then he has, uh, let us to the people. Uh, and then from that point on, whenever he wants to organize something or get something through, and I'll give you a few examples, he writes a pamphlet, he writes a major paper, and he gets it published. I wrote some of it, I promise, last time. Uh, he has written so much, he wrote his, dic uh, his diary for 68 years, uh, and only interrupted when he was Secretary of State when he was too busy to write the diary every day. Otherwise, it's uninterrupted. So people asked me last time to give them a list for things that could be good to get to know his mind. So I wrote that up over there. There's many, many other, uh, but this is all things you can get on the internet um, and give you an idea of, of uh, his mind. So I, uh, I should, I should actually. Oh, I have to take this. Um, uh, just to get for you uh, to get your little sense. John Adams, his dad, had been in, um, in England as a diplomat. And um, so John Quincy Adams, he's diplomat in, in uh, Holland. And um, uh, he goes up to London to see the king, King George III. And uh, uh, the king, um, Ask him some questions. He says, uh, "I cannot have an English accent. So you have to apologize." 
Are all Adamsons belong to Massachusetts? And um, he's told yes. And then he's asked, is your father uh, governor of Massachusetts? No, sir, says John Quincy. Uh, he's vice president of the United States. <laughs> Aye, George III pondered. And he cannot hold both officers at the same time? Mm. No, sir. <laughs> Where is your father now? At Philadelphia, I presume, the Congress being now in session. And where did you come from last? From Holland, sir. You have been employed there? Yes, sir, about a year. Have you been employed before and anywhere else? No, sir. So that's kind of George the Third. Here you have a guy who is diplomat, who is the ambassador to Holland from America, and this is George the Third. I just wanted to give you a little idea about these, the king. But anyway, um, so when he is a senator, he, um, let me just, what I want to go through now, oh, that's the wrong one, hold on, here we go. Uh, what I want to go through now is that he, oh, Uh, he more than, so I, I had said that he, last time, that he organized the North against slavery. He did two other things, or well, he did a lot of things, but things that uh, are crucial for that we are here today and that we have a nation uh, of the United States today. He was the one who played the greatest role, and without him, we wouldn't have a coast from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It wouldn't exist. He created the continental nation. And what he also did was that he um, uh, made, the, uh, made the foundation, the industrial foundation, so that Lincoln could win the Civil War, that the North was much stronger because of what John Quincy Adams had done. So those three main parts, so, but I would just, and that'll be a little quick, uh, that's why I wrote it up here so you can have a little overview. And I'm not going to go into details in the different treaties and so on because that'll be like for hours. But in 1803, because of the intervention of Senator John Quincy Adams, he's Senator from Massachusetts, what is being created is the possibility, he's the chairman of a committee and I, I, I shouldn't go through all this, uh, this strip, originally there had been an idea that maybe the future, um, future um, border would be there, but John Quincy Adams, because of his actions, the strip is up here. And this is the famous, I think it's 159 miles, 152 miles broad, and it's called the Adams Strip. Okay. Uh, then, uh, also in 1803, Louisiana is being bought for 60,000 francs, and that like doubles America overnight. Then in 1811, for the first time ever, John Quincy Adams writes the following. The first time ever where anybody have an idea about America as a continental nation. It's all him. And um, I'll just read for you. Here we go. Um, as completely as they were, they are already in New York and Pennsylvania and all the southern and western states, the Union is gone. Instead of a nation co coexisting with the North American continent, destined by God and nature to be the most populous and most powerful people ever combined under one social compact, we shall have an endless multitude of little insignificant clans and tribes, an eternal war with one another for a rock or a fish pond, the sport and fable of European masters and oppressors. And here it comes. The whole continent of North America appears to be destined by divine providence to be peopled by one nation, speaking one language, professing one general system of religious and political principles, 
and accustomed to one general tenor of social usages and customs. For the common happiness of them all, for their peace and prosperity, I believe it indispensable that they should be associated in one federal union. So here you have John Quincy Adams talking about a continental nation in 1811. I mean, the only thing we had was just like New England and a little bit into the West. And he already had an idea about into um, uh, a continental nation. The next thing he does is, um, let me just pull this one, which is even uh, more foresight like, um, when we have more than one more than the other, but it's just incredible the way he thinks. He is part on, he's on the board of directors of ABCFM, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. On that board is also uh, Boudinot, is John Jay and others, like key people that were key of uh, uh, founding this nation. And what they did, um, and some of you have heard some of Bob Wester's presentations, you might know some of it more in detail, but um, they wanted to counter the British in Asia. And so what they did is they, uh, whatever it was from Thailand, from Hawaii, Japan, China, if in any way they could get people from, like say Hawaii, a couple of young students and so forth could come to the United States to be educated, could be taught, they would make a delegation some of the missionaries that were around uh, that board, was connected with that board, they would bring, in fact, for example, in connection with Hawaii, they bought a printing machine, they bought an American farmer with them, they went with modern machinery. And um, then Hawaii, the Hawaiians at that time, uh, in 1820s, 1830s, did not have a written language, so they made a written language, they started printing books, they educated teachers, they built schools. Um, and it was not just to convert people to Christianity, no, it was to uh, put out the ideas as from the Plymouth uh, com social compact to do good. And uh, with what they did in Hawaii, made sure that uh, at one point the British tried to take over Hawaii, uh, but uh, it was um, sabotaged because of what the Americans already done. That was what the basis was for the Meiji Restoration in Japan bringing farmers, farm techniques, books, um, what they also brought to Japan, mm -hmm. little uh, toy uh, uh, railroads, so people could have it, uh, you know, trains this size, and people, wow. Um, and China, uh, this is a whole class in itself, but uh, the, uh, the gentleman who overthrew the emperor of China, the empress of China, Sun Yat-sen. Uh, he uh, was educated in a university in Hong Kong that was built by the ABCFM. He was baptized by a guy from there. Um, and uh, he was the one who single-handedly raised most of the money, traveled the, the world around six times to raise the money for the revolution. He was the one sitting in that 2,100 officers were trained in the United States, taken from the Chinatowns and smuggled back to China. Um, and this is a whole wonderful story in itself, but the, the father of China, who uh, learned a lot, and he would mention Abraham Lincoln all the time, he came directly out of the uh, networks of the uh, ABCFM. So if you can think, John Quincy Adams, in 1812, he had, a year before, he had thought about a continental nation. And if you can imagine the trees, the deserts, the, the, the um, how to get from the East Coast to the West Coast in, uh, at that time. So the year later, he launches, no, we should not just pass over the United States with these missionaries, with the young people that have been recruited to from Hawaii, from Japan, from China, and so on. No, we should also cross the Pacific to go to Japan, to China, uh, Thailand, and so forth. So he had the foresight and the idea to do good and to spread the idea about the principles of the United States 
uh, to hinder uh, British influence in Asia. So that was 1812. Uh, then you have the Peace of Ghent. Okay, the British plan. Okay. So the only thing we really have, this is 1814, is over here and it was put in here. So what is the British plan? Well, the idea is that the British want to split New England from the Union and then they want to do an attack into the Hudson Valleys and overpower New York. Remember they tried to attack Baltimore at Fort Henry where we got the flag from, or the, what do you, the song about the flag from. Uh, they burned down Washington uh, they wanted to go in and had sent boats, toward, boats towards New Orleans. They wanted to occupy the Mississippi Valley and take back Louisiana. They already had an outpost out here with the Hudson Bay Company. So you have, the idea was to have two ways to attack and basically control this whole area. And then this should be a buffer zone of Indians. It reminds me a little bit about these big national parks sometimes that have been created so that you can have no development and no co transport corridors and things like that. So this should be an Indian area and then attack from all different uh, ways and then be able to control the whole continent. That was the British plan. And uh, again, you have this book you can, if you want to read about the treaties. Uh, I will not go through, I mean the British let, uh, the British had won a lot, they burned Washington, they had won a, they won a lot of battles in the United States and the Americans were not in too good a position. So um, Russell, I think um, um, Clay and uh, another one and John Quincy Adams, they were there in Ghent and they were waiting and waiting and the British let them wait. And for weeks they were waiting that the negotiations should start. And so the British demanded all kinds of things. And um, through extraordinary diplomatic skill, I mean you have to have an idea, John Quincy Adams uh, got so trained in the good stuff from Europe and the evil that he was already at that time really good. Uh, in knowing the oligarchy and what he was dealing with. So he succeeded in completely, uh, together with the others, but he was the key anger man. He succeeded in completely spoiling everything that the British had hoped for uh, and planned. And what he, um, uh, what he writes in his memoirs after finally, after weeks and weeks and weeks, uh, of these negotiations at Ghent where the Americans end up because he doesn't take the bluff and he knows what they're up to and he stands up. So he writes in his memoirs, quote, I cannot close the record of this day without an humble offering to God for the conclusion to which it has pleased him to bring negotiations for peace at this place and a fervent prayer that its result may be propitious to the welfare, the best interests and the union of my country. So, uh, when he's 50 years old, he, um, he's, he's been ambassador in London a couple of years, and actually when he becomes ambassador, his father is really scared, or not, yeah, he says, this is a really dangerous position you have, uh, take care of yourself, more or less like that. So he's there for a couple of years in London, and he's called back by Monroe to become press, uh, Secretary of State. And he, um, uh, he has become a better American through being in London. He knows that himself too. And when he, I think he has his 50th birthday on the way back, and he writes to his wife, I told this story, I want to tell this story again, I told it last time, because he really loved Europe. He loved the libraries, the fountains, the operas, uh, the concert halls, uh, he thought it was beautiful, the buildings, uh, and the books, he was crazy. He would, every time he would go back and forth over the Atlantic, he had to have these special arrangements with trunks and trunks full of books that he bought. 
It's also nice because when you can read many languages, you can just buy in the different countries because you can read them all. So, uh, but he writes to his wife uh, upon returning to the United States. She was from England. He said, the worst thing that ever could befall me was if I had to end my days in Europe. And he was going back to Washington, D.C., where you still have slave trade. Uh, you have, it's muddy. There's no fountains. It is humid. Can you imagine Washington, D.C. in August? No. I mean, forget about air conditioning, but he didn't even have fans at the time. Uh, and he described at one point where he works, and he stays back in Washington, D.C. over the summer to do a lot of work. And I didn't know what to do with myself because if, it, if I go inside, it's too hot. If I go outside, the mosquitoes bite me. So it's like, that. Ah. But anyway, he said, no matter. And the worst thing that could befall me was if I had to spend the rest of my days in Europe. And that was because his entire life was dedicated to build up the United States and secure for the posterity a continental nation based upon those principles. And that was all he uh, lived his, uh, his life for. So, uh, and he has a little thing he put in his dictionary in his diary. He says, after he, um, the first day as Secretary of State, he says, Extend all seeing God thy hand in mercy still decree and make to bless my native land an instrument of me. He liked to make little verses, a lot of poetry, fun and serious. So he's Secretary of State and uh, this is a one man thing. He immediately makes an index of all the correspondences back and forth into the State Department. Uh, he makes a State Department library and uh, he personally reads all dispatches coming in from the world, uh, and he writes his own dispatches. He reads 40 newspapers a week, and that's the only period where he's so busy that he cannot keep up his diary. And then he uh, has some tremendous feats. Um, one of the, and I will uh, see here, one of the extremely important uh, treatises is the whole question about the transcontinental, uh, what, how, how he works to make, to begin to make the impact so that U.S. will become a transcontinental nation. So we have the Florida question. Um, in 1812, it's Florida is, I mean, the whole country, oh, the whole country is uh, controlled on and off by France, England, Spain in chunks. And they're all talking, thinking about in terms like the little kids play uh, around Matador and who controls what. So uh, there's a whole game about Cuba. So Florida at that time is controlled by Spain. And then in 1812, England invades Florida and they ally themselves with the uh, Indians and they massacre 500 Americans and take the scalps of 250. And there's a whole situation there. So, um, and there's a big propaganda what Spain wants to do. Spain wants to give Florida to Britain. If they, Spain, can get Louisiana, if, if, if the England will make sure that they, Spain, get Louisiana, that's what I mean, wheeling and dealing. Here you have. The United States is just very small, and you have all these European powers trying to figure out how they can, how they can um, split it up and take chunks of it and so on. And um, so John Quincy Adams issues a major paper in um, 1814, and this is what he does again and again. A little bit what Diane, when she went through the impact of what what Lynn has been doing in his interventions just for the last few months and over the years. And so does John Quincy Adams. He has a very sharp tongue and a very sharp pen. And um, so he uh, writes a paper, even before the treaty has been uh, made, he writes a paper to the Spanish government and he publicizes it and sends it out internationally. And in there he says, among other things, but it must carry a demonstration irresistible to the Spanish government. 
that the right of the United States can as little compound with impotence as with perfidy, and that Spain must immediately make her election, either to place a force in Florida, adequate at once to the protection of her territory and to the fulfillment of her engagement, or cede to the United States a province of which she retains nothing but the nominal possession, but which is, in fact, a derelict, open to the occupancy of every enemy, civilist or savage, of the United States, and serving no other earthly purpose than as a post of annoyance to them. There's much more to it. This is sent out. It, it has an electric response in Europe, where people realize this is the first time America has stood up and said, don't mess with me. Uh, uh, we are in, uh, we have a, um, we have our independence, we have our power, and uh, we decide here on our own continent. And already through these negotiations, uh, he had uh, said to the Spanish, our idea is to go all the way out to the west coast. That's why it's called the Transcontinental Treaty, which is February 1919. In eight, oh, sorry, 1819. And then, very important, which most people don't know, I'm not going to, he continues later on, the northwest coast, Oregon. An important thing I didn't put in that most books don't write about is he makes a very, very important treaty of the seas. Because at that time, there was a total piracy. The British were ruling the waves. Uh, so he does that. Um, another uh, total confirmation of the principle of the United States is the Monroe Doctrine. And I want to uh, tell people, I really would uh, recommend people reading Washington's Farewell Address from 1796. In there, Washington uh, makes some warnings to the next people to now take over uh, about uh, concerning the United States. He said, stress the union, be careful of foreign influence. Foreign influence is one of our worst uh, enemies. Uh, beware of party and factions. Party and factions is of evil. And it will, pro it will help foreign influence um, uh, to take over into the United States. Education, we have to educate our citizenry, and public credit. That's the key points in his farewell address, which is what uh, permeates everything that John Quincy Adams writes about and how he functions and so forth uh, throughout his life. It's a delightful little, not a little, but it's a delightful speech. So I would definitely recommend. What was the date of this farewell speech? Um, 1796. If you just go in and say Washington's farewell address, oh, you get it. This is the same if you want to read, uh, I mentioned last time, if you want to read uh, John Quincy Adams, his inauguration speech, his yearly uh, report to the Congress, all this, you can just go in on the internet and get it right out. So and then you can hear uh, you know, from his own mind. So again, to mobilize the, um, I mean, to, to uh, how can we keep the foreigners out of America? How can we keep them out of South America? I mean, if we succeed, and he had already succeeded with this, uh, what I showed before, and he already succeeded with it, but there's continuous, ever since, what, what the Russians point out, ever since 1763, uh, and until this day, and they have always succeeded, there have been an effort to destroy the United States, destroy the education, destroy the economy, uh, uh, and so on, I'll take up that a little bit later. Uh, there's, there's never been a pause to make sure the United States must not become what it was supposed to do because they will destroy the empire forever. They will destroy oligarchy forever because that meant it would be adopted throughout the world. So it has never been a let up till this day. And that's where a lot of people out in the streets are very naive today. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very important to, to see that. So anyway, a British newspaper uh, had written in 1820 that uh, they had a headline and a theme of a number of articles. What has America done for mankind? 
And what they want to do, they want US to ally with Great Britain to support reform and liberty in Spain, France, and Italy. And uh, uh, this is a little too hefty for John Quincy Adams. So when he's a Secretary of State, he goes to the US Congress the 4th of July in, 19, in 1821. And in order to kind of make himself anonymous, so to speak, he puts his own professor, old professor gown on. So he's staying there as a professor and not as a Secretary of State. And he gives this fantastic speech that I would definitely recommend people to get. It really get your blood flowing in a good way. 4th of July, 1821. And um, he does, it's not just a response to the British newspapers. It's also that he's very carefully, and it's very similar also to how LaRouche operates today, he's very carefully paving the way for one of the greatest accomplishments, the Monroe Doctrine. But in order to get that adopted, both by his fellow politicians and um, former presidents and so forth, and he had to educate them. He has to mobilize people. So he kind of mobilizes people before he takes his next move. And this speech is one of them, and it's a, it's a wonderful speech, I think. Um, I'll just read you a couple of quotes. Um, the Declaration of Independence. It was the first solemn declaration by a nation of the only legitimate foundation of civil government. It was the cornerstone of a new fabric destined to cover the surface of the globe. It demolished at a stroke the lawfulness of all governments founded upon conquest. It swept away all the rubbish of accumulated centuries of servitude. Um, and he goes on saying, what has America done for the benefit of mankind? Let our answer be this. America with the same voice which spoke herself into existence as a nation proclaimed to mankind the inextinguishable rights of human nature and the only lawful foundation of government. A little bit later he says, wherever the standard of freedom and independence has been or shall be unfurled, there will be her heart, her benedictions and her prayers. But she goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She is the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. She is the champion and vindictor only of her own. She well knows that by once enlisting under other banners than her own, she might become the dictatress of the world. She would no longer be the ruler of her own spirit. Think about that and Obama today and Bush and Cheney before that. Uh, George Washington and uh, then John Quincy Adams, absolutely no interference into other nations' affairs. Stay neutral, stay out of the wars in Europe. Uh, if you begin to intervene into other nations, you violate the very principles upon which this, this nation is founded. Then you become a dictatress which is exactly how other nations look at the United States today. You don't like the leader of uh, Syria? Get rid of him. You don't like the leader of Libya? Get rid of him. You don't like the leader of China? Get rid of him, if you can. <laughs> uh, anyway, but uh, you wanted to say something? How do you reconcile that with the manifest destiny? Uh, let me go on with this and we go, just remember. OK, because it's completely hanging together. OK. Um, she might become the district of the world and she would no longer be the ruler of her own spirit. Stand for the champions of Britannia, ruler of the waves. S uh, come and inquire what has America done for the benefit of mankind. In the half century which has elapsed since the declaration of American independence, what have you done for the benefit of mankind? America's glory is not dominion but liberty. Her march is the march of the mind. He predicts that England would be forced to give up India in this speech. This is in US Congress by a Secretary of State. So he predicts that England would be forced to give up India. And he ends, 
and to every individual among the sceptered lords of mankind, go thou and do likewise. So this is a speech to mobilize. It, I just read, this is the speech, it's much longer. I just read a few excerpts. I will definitely recommend you to print out the whole one. Um, and see, that led into then the whole discussion and a lot of fights. Um, uh, John Quincy Adams was the one formulating the Monroe Doctrine. I'll just tell, talk about it a little bit. Um, it bears the president's name, but the Secretary of State was the one formulating it. I know from some of the research I did that uh, uh, Monroe thought that John Quincy Adams was a little too sharp in his language certain places, so he kind of cut that out. But the general idea of the Monroe Doctrine was John Quincy Adams, and he was the one writing it. And what is the key thing? Uh, first of all, according to John Quincy Adams, we shall assume distinctly the principle that the American continents are no longer subject for any new European establishments. One, no colonization, stay out, goes both for North America and South America. Two, abstention from the wars of the European powers, that America should not be involved in any war abroad. Three, hands off South America, uh, where they say we could not view any interposition for the purpose of oppressing them, that is, in South America, or controlling them by any European power in any other light than as the manifestation of an unfriendly disposition towards the United States. And uh, when Lafayette, who was John Quincy Adams' good friend, when he heard about this, he said that this is the best little bit of paper that God ever permitted any man to give to the world. So um, you asked about uh, that in connection with manifest destiny. And it has everything to do with it, because the whole idea about coming to the new world was to get away from the oligarchical imperial policies of the old world, and that it was <coughs> impossible to do it in Europe. And so, therefore, to go to a new place and see to set up principles based upon the dignity of man in another place. Uh, and the whole idea about, uh, to this point, uh, to this day, there's been all efforts done either assassinating American presidents, uh, using parties, uh, what Washington warned about, to, for foreign influence, and to take over this nation and destroy the very fabric of it. So this to, uh, to keep the, Washington thought when he left, and uh, John Quincy Adams uh, writes about it too, but he gives about the United States another 10 years to be strong enough to withstand powers from outside. Um, but uh, with the, uh, uh, it was to, to tell the European, you had had all this um, control in the Southern Hemisphere from the Habsburgs and others, there was all these games. Uh, and to make it really clear after the United States became uh, strong, you stay out because otherwise that could also be done to influence up in North America. And the whole idea from George Washington and uh, through, to, through John Quincy Adams was the European powers stay out of this continent. No intrigues, no oligarchies in here. So that's the best I can to what you said. So, uh, but I'm very happy to get up because it's totally connected to it. Uh, and today, I mean, you can see with Obama and, the, and, and uh, England, you can see earlier that we had with Kissinger and special relationship where he talked in Chatham House how he first went to England and briefed them before he uh, briefed the President of the United States. Uh, it has been completely destroyed and undermined. Uh, very, very similar to what to what we have had the destruction of the credit system that we haven't really had a national bank in the United States since John Quincy Adams. 
to the same degree concerning allowance of foreign uh, influence into U.S. The, this fabric has been um, has been destroyed. So already, I mentioned earlier, already as a state. So that is enough. But that's enough regarding later on Northwest Coast Oregon. It's a lot of treaties and diplomatic in and out. So I'm not going to go through more than that because he succeeded. Actually, three weeks before he died, Mexico uh, then gave the United States, California, and New Mexico, and it was all done. And I believe in 1844, the Hudson Bay uh, Company moved from the Columbia River up to Vancouver and put up post there, and America got his own military post out uh, up in the northwest. You can just see here what I had planned. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, the other part I wanted to go through regarding uh, what he, uh, how he created the basis for Lincoln was the internal improvement of the United States. And there, every single book you can read, and every single biography, including biographies that kind of like John Quincy Adams, say he's bad president and one of the worst presidents we ever had. He was no good. And uh, the only way you can figure out, again, who he is, uh, very, very similar to Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, I have not read, I've read a lot of books about him, about him, and every one of them, he's just an old fuddy duffy, and uh, who likes women. I mean, that's bad. And then he makes a kite, and kind of what he's just a practical man. I mean, it doesn't make sense. So I, he smuggles in the profound ideas of Leibniz to make that the foundation for the United States. But uh, so the same thing with John Quincy Adams. Uh, what you have, I mean, that's my hypothesis. I mean, you ha also had when he was president, John Quincy Adams. He made or Secretary of State, sorry. He uh, for years had worked on weight and measures to figure out uh, what kind of system we should have in the United States, and he is obsessed. His wife complains about it, like when they're sitting eating dinner at night. I mean, it's the only thing she says. Is she says, he's working on this day and night as if his life depended upon it. And she thinks he's a little, you know. And then when he becomes Secretary of State, he's asked to make a suggestion what it should be. And he goes, that's that where he stays one summer in uh, Washington, D.C., all summer long to work on the weight and measures in the heat. And um, he makes a proposal, it's a big fat proposal, and it's very detailed with a comparison uh, of grains, and different grains, and fluid stuffs, and iron, and it's very detailed. And every single biography says that he proposes the metric system, because they didn't read the thing. I didn't read the whole thing. I actually had Jason do it. <laughs> uh, we had, uh, there's a lot to read, so he did it. And it turns out in the end, he <coughs> proposes what we have today um, in America with the insurance and whatever the system is called. It's not the metric system. So anyway, back to him as uh, president. One, so my hypothesis, is, to get back to my thought, my hypothesis is that because the slave holding powers um, uh, were really uh, getting very strong at that point, and because the whole Jackson takeover, uh, the destruction of the Second National Bank, that uh, people didn't really had a sense of, or you also had the history books being written, and he was kind of trying to be wiped out. I never really learned. I was, big in history in Denmark, and I never learned about John Quincy Adams. You heard about George Washington and Lincoln, but John Quincy Adams is up there with Lincoln and George Washington. He's not smaller than George Washington, absolutely not. And you know it when you, when you read his writings, he's a giant. He is the American Revolution, uh, a son of the American, and he continues it. Without him, we would not be in this room today, and that's a fact. Lincoln would never have made it. So, um, and one of the important things concerning um, 
uh, concerning uh, Lincoln's uh, success is the industrialization of uh, North America at that point. And he, when he, so he's inaugurated as president, and uh, if you read his memoirs, it's really like sometimes when uh, us as full-time members of the Ruth Organization, we have to do certain things. I got a real kick out of it because he writes in his diary, I'm so anxious. And he said, I can't get rid of it. And I'm working on getting rid of my anxiety. But it's the right weighing over me. I know Diane has never had that, but other people have tried <laughs> to have some anxiety. And it's really, and he says, I can't, I can't lift it away from me. And that's because he's working on his inauguration speech. And it's because he's going to go against the whole trend at the time. And he's going to call for a massive internal improvements. Uh, University in Washington, D.C. He wants to build lighthouses in the sky. He wants to build railroads, canals, and so forth. And he is being ridiculed. Uh, after his speech, ha, 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 lighthouse in the sky. He is a wacko, and so forth. And his whole point is, Europe has 130 observatories. America should have at least one. Uh, <laughs> But you have, uh, there's a real, remember when he was elected as president, it was a very close call between him and Jackson. Uh, so he had his years as a president and then the whole machinery came in, Jackson being a complete puppet for the British and the Confederates. So, so what he did do, he immediately assigns the US Army to begin developing the railroads of the country he assigns the uh, army engineers, oh, actually, let me just, he decides, uh, he decides the army engineers um, from West Point to make surveys of the railroads and so on. So uh, the first one is Baltimore, Ohio, and 60 railroads get planned in that way. Right the year when he takes over, uh, the Erie Canal is finished. And um, uh, you have, at the same time, um, Lincoln is beginning to pop up out in Illinois. And you might remember in, uh, Lincoln wants all kinds of projects to be begun in, in, uh, uh, in the Midwest. And then we have the crash after Jackson came in in 37 and it didn't function. But uh, anyway, so, uh, and then what he does, when Monroe had been president, what they did at that time, they had, America was huge, so you would take the public lands and sell the public lands and then use the income to dedicate it to internal improvement. So what Monroe had done is that he had given the states 100,000 acres of federal lands to sell and then to use that to build roads, 100,000 acres. What John Quincy Adams does is um, in 27, he takes two million acres to build roads to, uh, for the states to sell to build roads or canals. And then the year after, one million acres. He makes, uh, immediately put in protective tariffs. And he also proposes a naval expedition to explore the South Seas and Antarctica. And he says in his inauguration speech, he says, and you can get that inauguration speech, get it on the internet, right? He says, the magnificence and splendor of public works have been the in imperishable glories of the ancient republics. Just so would unborn millions of our posterity give thanks for the roads and aqueducts we are building today. So a total idea about hundreds of years ahead. So, um, let me just show you these. So, let me go back here. So there's nothing, there's, oops, there's not a canal here, and there's not a railroad, there's nothing. Here we have the Erie Canal. Oh, sorry. Okay, let's go back here, sorry. Okay, there's nothing. Erie Canal, see the Erie Canal? And a little railroad, Ohio, Baltimore, and 1840. What are the red border? Well, it's uh, where you have the ex 
the, the, like this is the west of the United States at that point. So this is just before the Civil War. You can see there's much more in the north than is in the south, and that's because what he initiated. Here we have John Quincy Adams' train. It's in Baltimore, and I went down there. It's on a railroad museum. Uh, see what else I have. Oh, huh? Which one? Oh, the bottom one. The bottom one. Oh, John Quincy Adams, 1835. Um, let me just see here. One piece of paper disappeared, sorry. So, and I took up last time uh, how when he was uh, 74 years old, how he um, uh, was asked to come out to Ohio to Cincinnati to lay the cornerstone for the first observatory in the United States. And the whole story, I'll just mention it very brief, where you had a young man uh, who had left his mother when he was 12 because he didn't want to be a burden for her, the father had died. And he managed to take care of himself and get to West Point, he became an army engineer. And he was crazy, and uh, he was among the engineers that surveyed the first, made the first surveys for the railroads, and he was crazy about the stars. So he wanted to build an observatory in America. And you can imagine he had a great supporter in John Quincy Adams. So what this young man would do, there's a whole story about it, very fascinating. He would, uh, had to raise money, a lot of money. So he uh, built these big metal plates and he put holes in them so for the stars. And then he put light in the back and then he would give uh, explanations to people what they saw in the sky. And thousands and thousands of people came to his uh, presentations. And he sold subscriptions and so on. So John Quincy Adams wrote a recommendations letter to Europe, uh, to different mirror makers and so forth. And then this young man went over. But he had too little money, so he had to go back and raise more money. So anyway. Um, uh, this is the observatory. So when John Quincy Adams is 74 years old, he's asked if he can come out and give a speech for the laying of the cornerstone of the United States first observatory. And he gives this beautiful, beautiful speech um, where I'll just read one quote from and think about what, uh, think about what Leibniz had to say earlier. The form of government found upon the principle of the natural equality of mankind, and of which the unalienable rights of the individual man are the cornerstone, is the government best adapted to the pursuit of happiness, as well of every individual as of the community. It is the only actual or immeasurable human government in which self-love and social are the same. Of such a government, intense patriotism must be the vital spark, animated by the immortal spirit of Christian benevolence, which enjoys self-love as the standard of brotherly affection and proclaims all mankind as a brotherhood of one kindred blood. The whole soul of every citizen of such a republic must be devoted to improve the condition of his country and of mankind. That was in that was in um, I was very, very much I would very, very much recommend this is here. An oration laying the cornerstone of an astronomical observatory. It's a profound speech, uh, philosophical. All his speeches are uh, most of them are like that. Like LaRouche who doesn't put up Fact one, two, three, four, five, and then here's the questions and here's the answers. John Quincy Adams is very similar. You know what's funny about that is that's where Neil Armstrong is from. Cincinnati. Oh, okay. Wow. Say it again. That that's where Neil Armstrong is from. So, um, so I wanted to uh, end with it and and take up. Also, I wanted to. I'm not, just not going to read from it. The, um, uh, in 1839, he gives a speech in New York, uh, a speech which has a tremendous 
uh, importance for building up the uh, opposition to the South. It is immediately printed in 8,000 copies and spread around. And uh, the content of it is used very much on the eve of the Civil War to mobilize people. So I would definitely recommend that. And then, as I said last time, um, oh yeah, I have, I'm not forgetting this, really important. Um, you have, if you haven't read it, uh, this is a must reading. So there's certain things I on purpose didn't take up, which is in this pamphlet. And as soon as Jackson was in, there's a huge fight to make sure that the National Bank is destroyed. And uh, John Quincy Adams fights <coughs> against it. And um, he's in US Congress at that time. And uh, at one point, he is not allowed to, he wants to protest against what's going on, how they're attacking the bank. What they're doing is they're taking, I don't think that was in Michael's paper, I don't, I don't remember. Um, they take money from the National Bank and then they redeposit them to the state banks. And they do that for free. And then the state banks re lend them out with interest, 6% interest. Mm. 6%. Yeah. So, but you have, here you have a national bank uh, where you uh, issue credit for the internal improvement and the running of the nation based upon the future. And one of the key things in the destruction of the very fabric of the nation, namely destroying that capability, one of the ways it was done was to take the funds from the national bank and put them into the state banks who then could lend them out and they could start speculating and do whatever they want. And of course also uh, support the states was already moving now like crazy for state rights and so on. This is a big thing in this speech here in the end uh, of state rights and how the nation is being torn apart uh, because of that whole push. So John Quincy Adams is not allowed to speak. They do some kind of stuff that he's not allowed to speak. So he issues a paper and it's a very philosophical paper again, uh, very go very much in depth. This one uh, regarding of uh, why they're doing it, and also a very eloquent background of Hamilton. So I want to end by saying that I think in this crisis we are in, with the danger of a world war. Uh, total explosion, collapse of the financial system, and a hyperinflation uh, explosion. This is pretty scary. And you look outside, and a lot of people they don't know very much. And I think the it's it's indispensable that each one of us, on a daily basis, um, sharpen our intent, sharpen the geometry, how our mind is functioning, based upon the principles of the United States becoming a trying to be as great as uh, John Quincy Adams. Um, I don't think we can, any of us in this room are standing on his shoulders, but at least we can run his footsteps or work on running his footsteps and then hopefully younger people coming after us will be able to um, stand next to him and then stand on his shoulders. Uh, because uh, not since John Quincy Adams have we really want America back. Uh, we had the destruction of the Second National Bank, and people were freaked out what he represented. And since then, you have had assassinations. You had Lincoln coming up. He won over the Confederacy, and he was killed. You've had similar cases without going into great detail. And although Roosevelt was great, we never uh, got to the point where this nation was built and operated upon the principles that was put in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And that's actually, in the great crisis we are in today, that's actually the point where we could have the possibility of really getting a spring cleaning uh, and getting uh, the nation found on those principles, but at the principle again. But unless, I mean, Diane mentioned trend lines and so on, unless we are really, uh, what do you call it? It's like somebody from another planet. 
that we have our identity as American citizens, the way George Washington and John Quincy Adams represented that, and others too, but as giants, and we learn from them and study them, and uh, also the philosophy in depth behind the principles which is the foundation for this nation. If you don't do that, you're not going to have enough strengths to, uh, to do what needs to be done, and more than strengths, but also get the ideas uh, that will just simply shape, uh, when you have that intent, shape what you're doing. Um, it's, uh, so it's very concrete. It's not just like a nice story and a nice history. I think it's absolutely essential uh, to uh, grapple with, to think about, and uh, to get to know this mind. Uh, because this is what America represents. Uh, and that's why Obama is not an American, even if he was born here. He <laughs> is not an American. Absolutely not. Bush is not an American. Cheney is not an American. We know Kissinger is not. But <laughs> you can make very clear if you are an American or not. I mean, it's different with other nations. I'm Danish. But uh, American is something very special.